When people ask what makes One Piece great, there's usually a fairly wide variety of responses that you'll hear. After all, One Piece does a lot of things exceptionally well, so maybe what stands out the most to one reader is the emotional backstories, maybe to another it's the cast of characters, and so on. However, though many of the reasons may vary from person to person, the one constant, universal point of praise that I see every One Piece fan put forward without fail is the world building. After all, this is one area where it is pretty much impossible to deny that One Piece excels. But while I'll regularly hear fans declare One Piece's world building as the best in the business, I rarely see people actually go in depth into what actually makes this the case. What is One Piece specifically doing that makes it the king of world building among manga? And even beyond that, what makes it impressive by the standards of most works of fiction? Well, with this video, I'm going to break down the brilliance of One Piece's world in detail and really get to the core of what makes this such an outstanding fantasy universe. To start with, great world building is not just about quantity or size. Bigger world with more stuff in it doesn't inherently mean better. On the surface level, yes, the One Piece world has a lot of stuff in it. There are four blues and the Grand Line, each of these seas has countless islands which themselves will often have multiple villages and cities and so on. Yes, that's a very large world, but that's surface level stuff. Part of what makes One Piece so impressive is not just that we have so many locations, but rather how fleshed out each location is. Out of the dozens and dozens of islands that we visit, many of these individual locations have better developed cultures, histories, and conflicts than other series' entire worlds. For instance, Skypea really is its own miniature universe. At the basic cultural level, Skypeans have their own food, clothing, and mannerisms, but beyond that, the society operates on an entirely unique system of technology that covers everything from household necessities to transportation to combat. The cloud environment, of course, makes for its own types of creatures, and the clouds themselves have their own subdivisions, which in turn are artificially manipulated to be used for architecture and design. Traditionally, these have always been a religious people, but interestingly, their system of governance has the official role of God at the top, as a leader chosen to protect them, followed by priests, divine soldiers, and even a police force. And most importantly, there are multiple sky races with a long history of tribal conflict over their most precious territory that carries their most precious resource, Verth. And that's just the tip of the iceberg, as even after leaving Skypea, we continue to learn that there are many more sky islands and a much deeper history to be discovered. Now, while that alone outstrips most individual manga locations, in the broader world of fantasy, One Piece admittedly pales in comparison to works that go so far as to, say, invent their own languages for their worlds. But where One Piece may fall short in terms of pure depth in this regard, I would still give it points in terms of fantastical creativity, meaning that most kingdoms, cities, and towns in fantasy worlds, such as a Middle-earth or a Westeros, tend to be more grounded in design, and are usually pulling from the same medieval framework to some degree, whereas nearly every island in One Piece is like something straight out of a dream. For instance, just the concept behind Water 7 city structure is an absolutely fantastical creation. This is an island that is not only constantly sinking, but is a regular victim to the calamity of the Aqua Laguna, and so as a result, the residents have been forced to continually build more and more levels of houses on the water, such that old buildings at the lower levels are gradually abandoned to the sea while a gigantic canal-based metropolis continually grows upwards. And while this on its own is a conceptually imaginative setup, we still delve into the creative intricacies of this small world. How does the city of water logistically work? How do people actually get around? What kind of food do they eat? What innovations have they had to construct to survive their situation? What kind of culture would develop in a city that is constantly in need of construction and repair? And so on. And really, with almost every major island, we're getting this sort of unique fantasy land built around an imaginative concept, while also getting an in-depth look at how the fantastical setup of this small world affects its inhabitants' culture and day-to-day -day life, the nuances of how each society work, and the history behind their small world. So going back to my point about how it's not just about the sheer size of the world, what's impressive is not that we can point to a lot of places on the One Piece map, it's the fact that all of these places mean something. They are all strikingly unique pieces of creativity, with drastically different designs, histories, cultures, and conflicts, such that they each feel like a fully fleshed out piece of the universe. So considering the vast number of locations in the One Piece world, it's already incredible how fleshed out these various components are, but now think about the macro view. 
how do all these parts fit together to create one intricately connected fictional universe? Because these islands don't just exist in their own little bubbles. Fishman Island's history isn't just Fishman Island's history. Its history is deeply connected to the world's history at large, and we can already see the ripples of Fishman Island's history affecting all corners of the world long before we actually get to that destination. Punk Hazard, Dressrosa, Zoe, etc. all have significant connections to other nations, figures, and major conflicts, and as the story progresses we are constantly gaining new perspective even on earlier islands and how they fit into the world at large. And that's a major difference between Oda and most other writers. Being creative in thinking of and fleshing out many locations individually isn't necessarily strong world building on its own. Too often I see stories where an arc takes place in a given location, and maybe we get some good context and focus on it for some time, but after the story moves past that point, the location is never heard of again. It's as though it may as well have never existed. A real world only really forms when you're making sure that all your new ideas fit together and link up with pre-existing ideas. That's what creates the sense of a real, structured, interconnected universe. And of course this applies to how Oda approaches the greater history and lore of the world as well. As much as we learn about the history of individual locations, there is this greater, all-encompassing lore of the story. The Void Century, Poneglyphs, the Ancient Kingdom, Will of Dee, Celestial Dragons, and so on, that provides a grander framework for everything else to fall into place. Similarly, think about the narrative framework the literal world itself provides. The physical structure of the One Piece world, with the red line down the middle, grand line running across, and the sea split into four blues is quite a unique setup. It's not the craziest world structure I've read about, but it is perfectly thought out in a way that makes many pieces of the narrative fit together logically and symbolically, in a manner I haven't seen in other fantasy worlds. For instance, getting to the end of the journey as they complete their trip around the Grand Line will inherently close Brook and Laboon's storylines as they will be right back where they started, coming over the mountain that Laboon's been banking his head against. The red line dividing the world physically makes for a logical reason for keeping the strongest pirates in the ocean separate from the Straw Hats before they are ready, and also serves to cleanly divide the story into two halves. The calm belt makes for the perfect reason for why leaving the adventure is not an option, and why this is a sea where you either grow stronger or die. The red line being so tall allows Mary Joa to be fittingly positioned at the top as a kingdom of the gods, symbolically in the center of the world far above everyone else, just as having Fishman Island be underneath the red line provides a nice contrast with the most oppressed people in the world being at its literal bottom, hidden and kept away from the light by those in power. But really, even if we leave behind all these broader points, like the islands, the lore, the structure of the world, etc., even if you just take a microscope to One Piece and simply get down to the real nitty gritty details of the story, it's insane how many micro-connections are constantly being written in at every opportunity possible, linking together characters and concepts spanning hundreds and hundreds of chapters apart. Hadrudin's drive to revive the giant pirates and the pride of Elbaf takes shape in the background of Big Mom's backstory, while the giant Rayleigh freed 300 chapters prior features as a baby. Pedro's fellow explorer who died is revealed to be Beipo's older brother, and Beipo only found law because he left Zo chasing after him. Whitebeard was being treated with medicine he bought from Doflamingo over 400 chapters before it was revealed that Doflamingo is the underworld boss who all pirates purchase goods from. Even the revolutionary army's activities across the world were being referenced all the way back in One Piece's infancy, before we even left East Blue. With each little connection, Oda is making the universe tighter and tighter, all the small pieces fitting together to give the reader the sense that this is an extraordinarily well thought out story, with an author who doesn't forget where we've been and who has a clear vision for where we're going, far ahead of what most other writers plan for. Which brings me to my next point. So One Piece has an extremely fleshed out, interconnected world but one of the biggest reasons it's so effective in drawing readers in and getting them obsessed that I rarely see talked about is how the world actually opens up. Because what's interesting is if you go all the way back to early One Piece, at the start of the series, you would never guess that this is going to shape up to become one of the most elaborate fictional universes ever. In fact, early One Piece actually stands out as being extraordinarily lacking in world building and exposition by the standards of pretty much any series. For the first five arcs, literally the only information we were given about the world is that there are seven pirates to look out for in the Grand Line. And there was actually not even a single time during the entire East Blue Saga up until Logetown where we cut away from the Straw Hats to a different location. 
which is insane to think about now considering how much outside world activity has become a defining staple of One Piece. As such, even though One Piece's world ultimately becomes extremely complex and intricate, it in no way seems that way at first, and actually it initially seems extremely simple and Straw Hat-centric. And this seemingly illogical decision to have a gigantic, elaborately thought out fantasy universe to offer your readers, and instead deliberately choosing to completely hide that from them for as long as possible, is, in retrospect, an absolutely brilliant writing choice. By starting with a seemingly unimpressive and minimalistic world building setup, and then gradually, bit by bit, ramping it up until suddenly the world is expanding far beyond anything the reader could initially have imagined at the onset of the journey, we genuinely get the sense that this has become an adventure with seemingly limitless possibilities. Basically starting out with an unassuming world, and over a long period of time allowing it to blow our minds and drastically exceed expectations, draws us into the same sense of romance that the Straw Hats are experiencing themselves. And what's especially important to doing this right is making sure that the world is expanding far ahead of the plot. Too often I see other series, Japanese and Western, where the world building only happens as the story demands. What do I mean by that? Well, I don't want to call out a bunch of other series, so I'll just use early One Piece itself as an example of this. So when do we first hear about Don Krieg, the most famous pirate in East Blue? When we get to the Don Krieg arc. When do we first hear about the famous Island of Doctors? When we're at the Drum Kingdom arc. When do we first hear about Islands in the Sky? When it's time for the story to go to the sky. This is normal for most series, where locations and organizations are typically introduced when it's time for the story to focus on them. And obviously there's nothing terribly wrong with that, as I said, One Piece often did this itself early on. But when world building is done like this, the world is not going to feel as real or thought out as it could be. For example, in the real world, I live in the United States. I don't know a lot of details about Belgium, and I admit I can't point to it on a map, but I obviously know it exists, and I have a general concept of it. Why? Because of course, in the real world, other locations naturally come up in conversation. You hear about them, you read about them, it's not as though Belgium needs to literally declare war on the United States tomorrow for that country to be mentioned to me for the first time ever. But that's what I mean when I say that most series will only world build once the story demands, whereas as One Piece progresses, the world building becomes a lot more organic, as Oda begins revealing the existence of significant places, organizations, and important concepts far before the narrative actually gets there. Fishman Island is revealed to exist almost 200 chapters before the Straw Hats reach it, and plenty of context is built up around it during that time span. Wano was first revealed in Thriller Bark, yet half the series passed before we actually saw it with our own eyes. Elbaf was one of the first locations we learned about in the Grand Line, and despite it being continually built up for the majority of the series, we're still nowhere near getting there. Look how ridiculously far back the concept of the Reverie was established, or how Law's explanation of pirate networks in the New World perfectly mirrors what we see over a hundred chapters later as we approach Big Mom. And even just offhand, easy to miss setups Oda casually drops, such as subtly revealing the Minx as a named race on the Sabodi auction price list, or occasionally mentioning St. Poplar as one of the sea train destinations, before the CP9 ultimately walk there on the train tracks to escape Eni's lobby. And really what this all goes towards, the real value of world building with so much forethought put into it, is the sense of immersion. We can tell that this world isn't being made up as the story goes along. Major locations, concepts, and organizations aren't just being dropped on us as we get to that part of the story, but rather we can already see far ahead that other aspects of the world are already loaded up over the horizon, just waiting for us to get there. And that's largely where the sense of immersion comes from, feeling that there is a vast and intricately structured fictional universe that has been clearly and cohesively thought out beforehand, and we are simply getting to explore it. To me, that sense of immersion is the ultimate goal of creating a fantasy world, and this is an area where One Piece absolutely excels. Not to mention that by continuing to feed us these drips of information about the greater world hundreds and hundreds of chapters in advance, with continually increasing frequency, the world building segments of One Piece have effectively turned into an almost addictive experience, where the post arc surges in outside information have in some ways become what we crave most. Teasing aspects of the world so far ahead gets the reader constantly speculating and asking questions. What's this? Oh, this exists? When are we going to see it? And so on. Such that, for example, whether or not you are enjoying Wano so far, at the very least the anticipation and excitement the vast majority of readers had going into Wano was very real 
and was the result of building up the mystique of this location for a decade in advance. Similarly, the excitement among the fandom to finally head into the New World after the time skip was unlike anything else I've ever seen for any other series. Because it's not like we were simply told that hey, there's this crazy other ocean out there, now let's go. After announcing its existence, Oda took his time for the next 200 chapters to just go all out building up the significance and the true level of that sea, such that the dramatic momentum finally heading into the New World was simply unprecedented and fitting to kick off the second half of the entire story. And lastly, of course, I should clarify that this is not to say that every little thing needs to be name dropped in advance. What's really cool is that Oda is still able to hit us with plenty of surprises and shocking reveals of new aspects of the world while still making sure they have been logically set up with the prior context he has already established. For example, the reveal of S.W.O.R.D. as a secret organization that opposes the Celestial Dragons is a great twist, but at the same time its existence naturally makes sense as a counter-organization to the previously established CP0, the shield of the Celestial Dragons. Similarly, the existence of CP0 was an exciting reveal, but at the same time it just naturally made sense as an upgraded New World version of the previously established CP9. And lastly, while CP9 was ultimately an organization that Oda did only reveal when the plot got to the CP9 arc, to be fair, at least here, CP9's hidden existence up till this point made sense, as Oda had been building up hints throughout the story that there are major problems with the world government, and CP9 was meant to be the final reveal of the world government's hidden dark side. And so all that is to say that One Piece's approach to world building is masterful in practically all aspects. Not only is the world meticulously structured, but the manner in which it actually opens up to the reader is beautifully executed as well. So we've talked a lot about how Oda does his world building and what makes it so exceptional, but now for this final segment I want to take a moment to appreciate what exactly has been built, because the One Piece world that we're looking at today is really something special. Initially, when our knowledge of the world was simple, we were made to believe that this is a straightforward setup, with a government in charge and a bunch of pirates who are criminals. But what is the One Piece world, really? In actuality, this is a fantasy world centered around five massive empires that are in conflict with each other over control of the sea. We have the four separate Yonko crews and the world government, each functioning as its own empire. Now I know we've been fed the labels that one is the government and the other four are simply pirates, but for a moment let's just forget the labels and look at what the dynamic is actually like. The world government is a large empire that has authority over many nations that come under its flag. Each Yonko crew is a large empire that has authority over many nations that come under its flag. The world government provides protection for its nations in return for payment. The Yonko provide protection for their nations in return for payment. Literally none of these empires have any sort of authority over the others. They are simply separate entities that exist in a delicate balance of power. The notion that one is some sort of official government of the world and the others are simply criminal groups is just propaganda being maintained by the largest and longest standing of the five empires. Functionally there is nothing that makes the world government's rule over its people any more authentic than Big Mom's rule over Totterland. And this facade of authority the world government attempts to maintain is remarkably fragile. It obviously isn't strong enough to wipe out all its competitors, it is simply the strongest of the five major empires, and depending on your interpretation of the Marine Ford War, it is arguably only barely the strongest out of the five, even relying on other criminals to maintain its status as the strongest. Yes, this empire rules the vast majority of the world, but the 10% that is most important is ruled by the other empires. It also certainly fears any of the other empires joining forces. The bottom line is, a government facing down four nearly equal military powers is not really a government and pirate situation. It would be like the United States claiming it is the one true government and that Russia and China are rebel forces. No, the One Piece universe at this point can very clearly be seen as a conflict of five nations at odds with one another. And while it seems like the world government has the most power at the moment, the fact is that nobody can truly claim to rule the ocean just yet, with all five of the empires seemingly bent on taking it over for themselves. As such, this question of who truly rules the sea is what the upcoming war is going to determine. So taking that into account, that this is really a world built around five giant empires who are at odds with each other over control of the sea. The story enters the new world at a point where a long-standing cold war between the five empires is about to come to an end. 
There has been a balance of power where everything has been at a stalemate, and it seems like any attempts by any of these five major empires to make a move on another leaves them vulnerable to third party action, basically making for this uneasy standstill where no big moves can be made. The Marine Ford incident sounds like it was the first major breach of the stalemate, and since then the Cold War has been coming to a close, with all the big players building their forces for when the stalemate ultimately breaks out into full-fledged world war. This is the true dynamic of the One Piece world, and this is what we get to explore throughout part 2. A world where all these major players are competing in a gigantic arms race. The Beast Pirates' strategy centers around creating as many smile zones as possible, as well as manufacturing advanced chemical weapons. Big Mom focuses on expanding her power by building more and more alliances. The Blackbeard Pirates hunt down Devil Fruit users and stockpile powerful abilities. The Marines are in the process of upgrading to New Age secret weapons. There are various valuable pieces that players can try to acquire, from simple metals to rare items such as poneglyphs to super rare weapons of mass destruction. Science and technology play a huge role, and just as the world government has Vegapunk, the Yonko have access to their own Vegapunk of sorts. And what's cool is over time we've come to realize that all of Caesar's experiments that we saw in Punk Hazard, the chemical weapons, the sad, and the gigantification, are all projects he's working on for the emperors. And beyond this, Oda even goes in-depth into realistic wartime dynamics that would inherently come out of all of this. With so many huge factions competing against each other, naturally a gigantic underworld system would develop as well. And as the story progresses, this is fleshed out more and more. We see there are major manufacturers, distributors, and buyers. And there are story arcs devoted to focusing on each of their operations, as well as time spent establishing the cause and effect chains that come from these systems. Caesar has been scamming one of his clients, Big Mom, but she could not go after him so long as he was protected by Doflamingo. As if Doflamingo, the supplier, goes down, then Kaido, the buyer, would go after whoever messed with his business. And when Doflamingo, the biggest underworld supplier, does ultimately go down, we see this leads to a boom in business for other criminal organizations as they take his clients and similarly gives an advantage to parties who are fighting Doflamingo's buyers. And on the flip side, we see that without a proper middleman, the major empires themselves are even forced to directly do under-the-table deals with each other. And Doflamingo isn't even the only underworld figure who is doing deals on both sides. We see Morgans controls the world's information, and he apparently takes checks from the government while socializing with pirates at the same time. Stussy is an underworld head who is literally a government agent, and of course there are plenty of double agents across the board with spies in the marines and spies among the pirates as well, with more that are surely still to be revealed. But of course, what separates this setup from a real world at war is that this is a fantasy universe where characters have superhuman abilities. And that actually may be my favorite aspect of this gigantic, extensively fleshed out world war setup. That even with all the realistic arms race elements, all the competition for technology, weapons, information, allies, and so on, there's this whole other dimension to it where the characters themselves are military assets. Something as simple as Aokiji moving from the Marines to the Blackbeard fleet is essentially like one army stealing a nuclear weapon from another. It makes for a universe where there is a much more detailed and structured wartime setup than most other fantasy worlds tend to have, but at the same time all the superpowered hype that more grounded and realistic war stories lack. It's exciting to see individual soldiers have extreme value. It's fun to measure and compare the power of these vast organizations by the quality of soldiers they have. And man, Oda has put in a lot of world building time into fleshing out the military structures of the major factions. Yonko empires are composed of armies with legions upon legions of subordinates, organized into levels upon levels of ranks, special forces within those ranks, and even subdivisions among the basic low level foot soldiers. And that's not to mention the numerous external affiliate groups that are also under their command. And even all that is dwarfed by the world government's elaborate hierarchy. The Marines have their own extensively detailed ranking system, with varying responsibilities and privileges, special forces units, secret units, and so on. Not to mention the prison system of Impel Down, the justice system of Fenny's Lobby, and the increasingly intricate intelligence system of Cypherpole, with all of this going back to the actual Celestial Dragon system at the top of it all, which we are still in the process of uncovering more information about. Even just the individual warlords under the world government have their own personal, full-scale organizations underneath them with their own elaborate hierarchies. And even beyond the big players of the world, we still have more underworld organizations for us to learn about, the Revolutionary Army which is starting to unveil its own larger structure, and most importantly a large group of up and coming rookies who are each trying to build up their own factions. 
And speaking of which, there is one last side to this world that I want to touch on, which is that just as much as this is a world at war, this world is also a ladder. So let's reframe things one last time. The Grand Line is essentially a gigantic tournament, where most pirates come in with the intent to climb, and with the title of Pirate King, at the very top of the ladder. The world is structured such that the further you go on the Grand Line, the higher you must climb the metaphorical ladder, with only the very strongest contenders for the top residing in the second half of the Grand Line. As Oda builds his world, we get a deeper understanding of how this Grand Tournament seems to work. There's obviously a famous generation of rookies gunning for the top today, but we can similarly see the big name rookies of the generation before them and how far they got. Some have made it near the very top of the ladder. Others seem to have been crushed along the way and sent back down, fittingly sent back to the first half of the Grand Line. And others still seem to have positioned themselves safely several rungs below the top, with no hope of ever actually reaching the summit, but secure enough to think that they will never fall from their rung. And we can even observe the generation before that one, where the big names seem to have either died out or fallen from relevance, or solidly secured their spot near the very top of the ladder and held onto it till today. And now finally we're going to get to see how far the up and comers of this newest generation will get, with many already seemingly hitting walls. So taking all this into account, I have to say I've personally never seen such a unique fusion of three completely different world concepts combined into one series before. The vast ocean setting and great distances between islands make this a true open world adventure setup. But the large scale centerpiece conflict between five empires simultaneously makes it a fully fleshed out world war setup. And then the survival of the fittest setting of the Grand Line also fits the bill for a gigantic survival tournament setup. And all of these dimensions of the One Piece world are somehow made to fit together brilliantly. And now I'll close by saying this. Great world building isn't just about making a large universe with a bunch of stuff in it. Anyone can think of a bunch of islands and keep on expanding. The hard part is making sure that as you're gradually crafting this large scale universe piece by piece, you're making sure that every part is fleshed out, that everything you're creating fits together, that it all opens up organically, and that your final product is a strikingly unique creation. And that is what we see when we look at the One Piece world. Countless organizations and factions and nations and hierarchies, local politics, global politics, conflicts that are subsections of larger conflicts that are subsections of larger conflicts, originating from a rich and mysterious lore that is still being uncovered, with even entirely different world concepts being mixed and matched. All of it masterfully woven together to create a deep, complex, and cohesive fictional universe. And that's why it's true when they say, One Piece is the king of world building. If you enjoyed this video, then definitely like, share, and subscribe. And you can join my Patreon to help me continue making videos like this in the future. Benefits include voting on future video topics and access to my Extended Thoughts podcast. With special thanks to Hoursblank13, A. Abazi, Felix Four Color, Lord Titan, Crimson Crystal, Lorenzo Linares, Spike SP, Sebastian SC, Simon Fines, Dice, Agam, Mr. Pike, Andy Tamelli, Koa Tran, Rohan Chug, Sriracha Limes, Juan Perret, Reezy, Moses Williams, Tumsun Nurmusa, Walkeron, Garrett Clark, Behanort, Deku, JL, Felix Tangwe, Oliver H, Mohammed Al Nayedi, The Boy 13th, Frank Cervantes, Mo Musa, Chris Kresser, Socialed, Axel Jabia, Savvy, Fuzzball Pete, Hirbond, Chandre 3000, Jarrett, Melanie G, Bree, Siddharth Vadnerker, Ryan Gerada, Rob Williams, Wiase, Luis Aguirre, Dark Eternal, Joaquim Torneus, Laura, Rohanite, Zaos, Schwalbe, Patron, Lun, Michelle Dreyer, Amalite 2609, Mohammed Momin, William Trainer, Taix Chung, Tanvi, Adam Meyer, Kyoko is here. Lena, Mayan Kikus, Albin Osterval, and Porkats the Ace.